here we'll try to take over and now the next session which is very much important and we all know it is insulin pump which has to be educated to all our uh, respected eminent uh, colleagues faculties all physicians all delegates paramedics and all of them who are who have joined us all of you welcome to the insulin pump school this is first school all over world which is being created on this virtual platform so all thanks to all the organizing committee members all all people mostly i would like to thank bansi sir dr amit dr rakesh parik jyoti dev sir to have an idea of insulin pump and give me this opportunity to chair this session so i would like to have yes so i would like to have our first speaker eminent speaker dr debashish das sir he is specifically very eminent physician he is working in field of technology since past many years he is a consultant physician and diabetologist at andheri mumbai medical education leader in metronics diabetes asia pacific advisor to birac ministry of science and technology government of india for medical technology and digital health startups fundings advisor and mentor to it mumbai and former head of healthcare and life sciences in department of internal trade british high commission government of uk so lot and lot in his name but today he is going to enlighten us about the specific needs the call specifically what it what it will take today so i think so i will try to share the stage with dr debashish dr debashish you can present your slides uh, thank you dr sarov for the warm introduction uh, again first of all again want to thank you dr bansi dr uh, rakesh parik dr amit and all the organizers uh, for having me at this uh, first time a huge mega uh, technology uh, on on diabetes forum so i will not taking time i'll share my screen i hope my slides are visible yes sir uh again welcome again all of you uh, so my talk is on onboarding choosing the right pump and initiation so i will uh, take you through that and i hope uh, i will give some more insight into how we as physicians we should uh choose the right pump and uh, how we initiate yeah now first question is who is a candidate for insulin pump sir i think a no brainer i think every type 1 diabetes should be given this option everyone in in most of the countries this is standard of care and and most of the payers and government funding they do support uh, insulin pumps in most of the countries like in usa in european nations uh, in india there is definitely this is lacking i hope it uh, start soon and 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 when we say it is a type 1 and maybe a type 2 uh, on mdi now a lot of uh, my learned colleagues will say earlier we used to say that the patient should be highly educated motivated could count carbs should have the best insulin to cover and and then we recommend them but however in real life uh we find that maybe patients with limited education basic insulin or even sometimes without insulin and may not have good control may not be doing carb counting well sometimes they do well on pump so so there's a difference in the ideal patients and the real life patients now different needs different choices whether uh, the patient people needs are either convenience or clinical could it be cost or lifestyle a, a patient's preference for delivering their insulin may change depending on what else is going on in their life so it is very very important to listen and understand their needs in order to set them 
on a path of success so always it it we should do a, a, a education awareness not only of the patients and also of the caregivers the family who stay very close to them so that they have the backup they have the support they need because it's a journey it's nothing uh, one day or two day thing now i think uh, jazz said in the earlier that there is no one size fits all approach to technology that uh, can be used in people with diabetes so we always have to customize it or personalize it depending on different uh, patient type now if you are looking for a pump now there are various options of pump it could be a simple 700g which has is only insulin delivering with no cgm integration it could be 720g which has pump delivery with cgm 740g it could be cgm with the predictive low glucose suspect or then it could be 770g or which has only it's it's a automatic insulin delivery with auto basal only and and the latest one that the advanced hybrid closed loop system 780g which has both automatic basal delivery and also automatic corrections so there are a lot of options now depending on individual patient criteria we have to decide and and not only the physician the physician can only give option but we should always take the patient and the families along with where to take the decision now let's see what are the recommendations from different bodies now ada if you see ada recommends insulin pump therapy should be considered an option for all adults and youth with type 1 and type 2 on mdi who can manage device that plain insulin pump and what they say about insulin pump and sensor systems that sensor augmented pump therapy with automatic low glucose suspend may be considered for adults and youth with diabetes to prevent or mitigate episodes of hypoglycemia and on aids that is automatic insulin delivery systems and it could be considered in youth and adults with type 1 to improve glycemic control so this is the stand which ada takes and what ace says that insulin pump without cgm that use of an insulin pump without cgm could be used to manage diabetes in persons who are achieving glycemic targets with minimal time below range or who report infrequent episodes of symptomatic hypoglycemia and who are using smbg on a regular basis that is at least more than four times a day and combined insulin pump with cgm with low glucose suspend feature it is recommended for all persons with type 1 to reduce the severity and duration of hypoglycemia but the predictive low glucose suspend is strongly recommended for people with type 1 to mitigate hypoglycemia and about aids ace has a strong recommendation that everyone with type 1 diabetes should be given off an aid because a lot of studies have shown that it improves tir with minimal tbr time below range and this should, method of insulin delivery should prefer on other modalities so as i said so when we when we decide give this option to the patient depending on their clinical status their hypoglycemia status their economic status and their knowledge about technology is very very important while taking a decision which pump to recommend them and let them take the decision along with the physician and the family now when when you when the patient agrees for insulin pumps it is very very important to set the correct expectations because i have seen sometimes patients in in the clinics or in some hospital they come and they expect that if they take a insulin pump with everything on it and they just put in and and it will automatically cure their diabetes and they don't have to do anything but that is not the reality so it is always important to set the expectations correct so if they are using insulin pump to make them understand of nutrition carb counting a meal boluses then the other c is the corrective insulin how uh, what the system recommends or how they can calculate and if they are using a sensor augmented pump then the calibration timings and how many times they have to so setting expectations and the importance of uh, carb counting meals correction boluses and calibrations is quite important now let's see how we calculate the initial pump start step settings 
so this is just an uh, way of recommendation you might do a little bit here and there that is totally perfect sometimes i also do in my clinic in a different way but normally it is advisable that whatever is the total injection dose we reduce by 25% and then whatever the dose comes you make it 50 50 or 40 60 so you get the total daily basal total daily bolus and once you get the basal you divide by 24 to get the hourly basal rates and if you have the total bolus if you are not using a bolus wizard then you can divide it by 3 or maybe you can do a little bit of uh, permutation and combination depending on the uh, quantity and quality of food you take if different meals and then you can calculate the isf insulin sensitivity factor that is the standardized formula and the insulin to carb ratio uh, although here we have taken 500 and some of the recommendations are 300 or 350 it is very very flexible it's up to you and and insulin sensitivity factor we have taken 1800 but sometimes some some uh, journals or recommendation is 1500 or 1700 again this is just a start once you start this you can always change it depending on the glycemic uh, status and the trends so this is how uh, the same thing as i said so you you start the uh, total pump dose you get the basal rate then the bolus wizard for bolus wizard you need icr isf and that for target range and active insulin time we choose depending on the patient history and clinical judgment so let's take an example this is just for education purpose uh, uh, patient named avery she is a 39 year old female type 2 diabetes for 7 years uh, a1c 9% height 5.8 weight 129 kg bmi 43.3 Uh, she is on MDI insulin regimen, Presiba U100, 102, Humalog 12, 14, 34, Trulicity that is a GLP-1, 1.5. So if you calculate the total basal and bolus, it comes to around 162 units. That's the total pre-pump dose. Now let's take the same uh, formulas. So 162 units uh, we reduce by 25 percent. It comes to around 121 units. Now 121 units. we to make it simple we make it 50 50 so if you see so the basal comes to total basal per day 60.75 units total bolus comes to 60.75 units now once you have the total basal you divide by 24 hours and then you get the basal rate as 2.53 units per hour so in case of a type 2 patient it is uh, unless the patient has severe hypoglycemia or you know there is a the issue of hypoglycemia unawareness maybe one basal rate to start is fine enough to start and then you can change depending on the glycemic profile but usually in a type 1 patient one may not be feasible usually commonly we have seen four to five basal rates required but if you are not sure of the glycemic trend you can start with one or 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 two if there are hypoglycemia keeping it low at the night and then depending on the glycemic profile depending on the cgm report or smbg you can change it depending on the uh, glucose readings and for the fixed bolus we recommend that everybody should do a carb counting and use the bolus calculator what the system recommends and take it a lot of patients at least in india we know and even i have i've seen in, um, in in us some of from my colleagues from us who practice in in europe even they also recommend a fixed bolus because patients are not comfortable doing a carb counting so if it is 60 units bolus so if you divide by 3 20 20 20 20, 20 breakfast lunch dinner then you can always change that depending on if the patient has a heavy breakfast maybe increase little bit on the breakfast have a light lunch reduce in lunch and then you start somewhere and then depending on the uh, glycemic trend and and the uh, reading you can change it but advisable is to do a bolus visit and uh for and to use a bolus wizard as i said we need a isf so 1800 divided by 121 in this case which is around 14.81 mg per deciliter and icr is 500 divided by 121 that's around 4.1 that's that's the amount of for for every four carbs you need one unit of insulin and bg targets again uh, it it depends from person to person uh, so you could choose a range 9200 or 9210 depend on the patient type patient age a hypoglycemia status everything taking into consideration or you can give a single value 92 9100 200 
and uh, we recommend active insulin time if it is not a automatic insulin delivery system to keep it around three to four hours if it is a aid we recommend two to three hours and and when it is a bolus wizard uh, into, into into calculation usually if it is the higher value it is taken when the sugars are high and if it's the sugars are low they take the lower value so so this is uh, how the initial calculations are and when you are transitioning a patient from mdi to pump please uh, again remember that patient is already on a long acting insulin maybe on a treceba maybe on a glargine maybe may, may on on levemir or something else so please instruct the patient to stop uh, on the on the pump start uh, the day before uh, intermittent acting insulin at least 12 hours if it is a long acting like glargine 24 hours if it is ultra long acting maybe 36 to 48 hours and give small amount of rapidic and insulin every 3 to 4 hours to maintain glucose control or if you cannot do it if you cannot stop or if it is uh, difficult then let the patient come to your clinic the day you start, want to start pump just whatever is the calculation you just reduce the uh, basal rate you give the patient a temporary basal rate reduced by 50 percent or 80 percent for the amount of hours you you know glargine or or deglutec is going to act so you give a temporary basal rate for 12 hours or 24 hours and then automatically the patient uh, the system goes into the original uh, basal rate you can do that also and if it is a type 2 patient then uh, advisable is to stop the insulin secretagogues uh, sulfonylureas and megalitinides because uh, you never know how the patient is going to uh, behave continue metformin glp1 if it is already going dpp4 sglt2 other sensitizers and one set goal you can consider discontinuing oral or uh, non insulin injectables if it deteriorates you can always resume it uh, insulin requirements often decrease once glucose levels normalize so please be careful about hypoglycemia and adjust accordingly now i'm just going to take you quickly uh, a, a recent paper which is published uh, by dr petrovsky uh, and the group from qatar uh, i think i forgot the hospital name it was just published in the bmc endocrine in 2022 early part uh, uh, just a couple of weeks back and and they have shown a glycemic outcome and a proper 10 day protocol of shifting a type 1 patients from mdi to the automated uh, insulin delivery system called 780g and just to give you a little bit background uh, about 780g system it it is a automatic insulin delivery system and once a patient uses it on manual uh, mode for two days 40 hours then the patient uh, can be the system can be go uh, change the mode into automatic delivery and the system automatically delivers the basal insulin and also automatically delivers the corrective insulin if the sugars go high depending on the sensor glucose and there are different settings you can do in this system so this is coming to this this study uh, about initiation and uh, so this study showed that uh, this was typically type 1 patients 34 patients altogether in their center and they could show that mdi plus cgm from from the time window you can see from 40 42.1 in 3 months into the aid of 780g system they could improve to 78.8% and and not much change in the time below range and there was no severe hypoglycemia no diabetic ketosis and hospital admission and they also showed the uh, the flow how they could achieve that you can see this is time and range in evolution for the uh, over 3 months you can see mdi plus cgm 42.1 sap sensor augmented pump 3 days 53.7 and you can see from the first day till the third month gradually they have improved the time and range of the patient without changing the time below range in in these 34 patients wonderful study and coming the basically the initiation protocol what they did so they did into a uh, step 1 2 3 4 step 1 was the day 1 which they basically did a compatibility assessment of 780g 1.5 hours eligibility criteria system introduction expectations responsibilities uh, the next step was 4 days 2 uh, hours each day group education sensor was started on the day 1 they again did hcl readiness uh, step 3 that was uh, over 3 days uh, sap start suspend before low was activated cgm was reviewed they did the adjustment for icr ait and target 
they also look at again hcl readiness and after the seven, tenth day they started the hcl the 780g system with uh, these type of follow -up. so basically this was a step one as i said so this was a compatibility assessment it's a group visit with an educator of 1.5 hours so they did the system introduction feel the pump hcl functioning the concept of time and range patient's expectations patient's responsibility connectivity then about system readiness like carb counting bolus for carbs smbg and sensor calibrations repeat education if needed so and and the step step two was uh four consecutive days you can see day one was 780g pump buttons and menus uh, glucose display reading, then the mobile and, and the app connection, then the sensor insertion, alerts, calibration. Day two was more on bolus wizard, pump disconnection, uh, SAP mode, basal rate, suspend before low, then what is uh, the different modes, auto basal target, AITs. Day three was again about more on care link, uh, sensor infusion set change, and, and the day four was managing their own situation like if their patient goes into low glucose high glucose ketoacidosis sickness exercise anything of that and 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 the third step was three days they reviewed the cgm data of the seven day of m patient on mdi and they did all the uh, system changes of basal rates uh, glucose targets icr isf and initiate sap with suspend before low feature on the third step for three days and then uh, once the patient was on SAP, sensor augmented pump, for three days on the manual mode, then the patient was changed into the AHCL mode, that is the 780 juice system in the automatic mode. So they could adjust the ICR uh, uh, and then AIT to two hours and the glucose target as 100. And, and lastly, they did uh, some of the follow-up visits uh, for over a month over phone and something in the clinics. Assess patients' engagement, sensorware, smart guard use, sensor calibrations, carb counting, meal bolus timing, auto correction. Again, adjust the ICR AIT. And because this is very critical, that sense setting adjustment during the first month is always critical to take it forward. So education and training is very very key when somebody wants to on the, get into the technology and and do well. So this is how they did it in their center and, and they published it. You might have a different way of doing in your own clinics. That is totally perfect because uh, he has a whole team. But if you, if you have an individual clinic, maybe your type of uh, things will change. Now with this automatic insulin delivery systems as compared to uh, only insulin pump, the, the inputs will change. For example, uh, if it is automatic insulin system, the algorithm will do automatic basal delivery. So auto, once you feel uh, automatic, uh, you fix the automatic basal, it will do it. Then the insulin sensitivity factor also the algorithm does, auto correction also does. Only the clinician for this automatic delivery does the carb ratio. Again, the recommended active insulin time two hours has to be set or recommended by clinician. And also the auto basal target of 100 should be given by the clinician. So if it is pump only, and if it is AID, then your interaction and uh, other things will change. So, so that was all in my presentation about uh, how uh, you you uh, decide on uh, uh, whom to at least recommend, discuss about insulin pumps, uh, what are the different criterias and, and uh, uh, who is the right candidate and how to give them options of different uh, pumps we have depending on the cost, depending on the clinical scenario, uh, the education, the tech savviness, everything, and then initiate on that basic line. As I said, we just start there. Depending on the glycemic profile, we change the settings uh, once we meet them uh, every monthly and then maybe uh, every three monthly or six monthly. Thank you again for a patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Debashi. Such a nice presentation. And I think so. We have onboarded the flight for insulin pump. Now uh, we have onboarded the flight and we have tried to take all the precautions. Now we can move forward. The flight has to continue. Most important part in insulin pump therapy comes when we talk about our infants, toddlers, preschool people. So this group of person have to be catered very nicely. For this, we have to learn the practical approach, how to manage the insulin pump settings, 
how to give bonuses how to card count how to maintain the basic needs for all the friends with type 1 diabetes who are going to school or pre schools how can we do that so for this we have our eminent international speaker and faculty for insulin pump dr frida sandberg ma'am she is from sweden and she will talk about the management of insulin pump in settings of infant toddler and pre schools so ma'am the stage is yours now you can share your slides thank you very much for your kind invitation to join this meeting and my thoughts on this and now i will do the screen sharing So now I think you have my slides. Yes, ma'am. We can visualize your slides. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind invitation. Thank I you. have no conflict of interest, but Dr. I have Frida. to. Dr. Frida, Dr. Frida, yes? can you make it full flight mode? Full, uh, full uh, once uh, stop share your screen and uh, make it on a slide show mode. After that, uh, uh, at the time of share screen, you have to select a PowerPoint presentation with slide show mode. Fine, yeah, I think you will get it anyhow. So, yeah. I have no conflict of interest, but I'm biased by the fact that I'm working up in the northwest end of Europe. When we're talking about this group of patients, we know that they have a very heavy risk of cardiovascular death and the cardiovascular uh, morbidity quite early and they also have an age-related risk of having not only cardiovascular but also uh, cerebral complications of diabetes luckily we have an affectable risk 
factor, which is APA1C. And that's why we have to move into normal glycemia in this group. So that's why I'm very thankful that we are talking about this group in the pump school. When following up these patients, you need to know that you don't only have to follow glycemia as HbA1c, time in target, time in range, and time below target. You also have to be very keen to follow up that they have good quality of life and a good treatment satisfaction. You need to follow an age-appropriate development, and you need to follow the growth chart. Uh, I'm very glad to, to see that India is participating in the International Sweet Network to compare outcomes because comparison of outcomes is a good contributor to successful treatment. And uh, uh, we always need to network on this. And this figure shows th that the bigger the bubble, the bigger uh, the clinic, and the higher up on uh, uh, this scale means that you have a higher proportion of children with a very high HbA1c above 10%. And the further to the right on the picture, the number of patients with a low HbA1c under 7.5% increases. And um, those two clinics most to the lower right are the ones in Sweden participating in the network. Dr. Freda, sorry to interrupt. Dr. Freda, can we, can we make it full screen? I think the event team can help us out because uh, this may not be very clear and it might be difficult for you to manage as well. Uh, is it Dr. possible to... Dr. Rakesh. Uh, so, I, I will talk you through this, uh, yeah. and I think what is important to know that we have a high uh, achievement of HbA1c targets. On our, we collect data nationally, and we see that more than 60% of our preschoolers, infants and toddlers with type 1 diabetes use uh, all over the national population, have more than 60% have an HbA1c below seven and seven percent and we have published this and we can also uh, acknowledge that this is important this is possible also in other countries as an australian group has published this and how do we get this i think this is the key where do we aim the matter is not which pump we use the aim the matter is where do we aim to get in Sweden, we are very clear that we want the blood sugar to be between between four and or four and eight, and that means seventy to one hundred and forty. In the rest of the world, most people aim at four to ten millimole per liter, equaling seventy to one hundred and eighty milligram per deciliter. Of course, you can insulin treat in different manners, but if you compare this with playing dart, the person who aims to hit the center of the circle is probably going to be a better dart player than the one who aims to just, just hit anywhere in the target. And this is important. What uh, I can say from my experience is that more than 99% of children with diabetes in Sweden use CGM. We are very happy to have a very solid reimbursement system that is very helpful in this. Uh, and our national recommendation is in line with the international recommendation that all children, if possible, younger than seven years, should have insulin treatment with an insulin pump. And in Sweden, that is above 85% in this age group. But I also want to stress, as the former speaker, that no technology can replace care. Uh, we really know, have to know that pump is only a tool. We need a lot of time and knowledge. We need to spend a lot of time with these families. We sit for hours and talk with them, with the parents and some, also with the child. And of course, this is most important in the early start of the treatment. When we follow up, and here come some practical clues for you. Talk with parents and child, not to them, talk with them. 
identify subjective problems and the solutions they have tried. It's no good if you come and try something and suggest something and they have already tried it and it didn't work. Use upload of pump and CGM as a tool for talk talking. It's impossible to interpret these data without the story. So if you are a new beginner in treating toddlers with a pump, just take a practical example from upload of data from a, a day and talk about that day. What did actually happen? What did they do? What were the problems? And be aware that you see the data aggregated and as a history, but the family perceive them as an ongoing more or less chaos. And the uploaded data often lead to very detailed discussions on meal content and timing, bolus dosing, fear of hypo and hyperglycemia, and use this for education and go deep in the details. Did you actually have one or one and a half sandwich at that time? And when did you get the bolus dose and what happened and what were the causes of uh, different things happening? It could be a sibling making a quarrel and then the situation goes out of the school book. And your job as a physician or, as an, or a nurse is to help the family to identify patterns because families see things happen in details, you can sit down with them and talk about what does usually happen on Thursdays or what are the morning stress in your family. One special topic that you don't have can forget is the skin care because if the skin can't tolerate the pump treatment and the CGM, then you are in big problem. And young children have very sensible skin, so cleaning with soap and water and uh, using uh, good skin care and not traumatizing by uh, peeling the needles off uh, is, uh, is important. So early intervention and early has two aspects. It's a newly diagnosed infant, toddler or preschooler with type one diabetes. We start with inpatient care, step transfer to outpatient care. We work with normal glycemia, four to eight, from onset of treatment. And this is pedagogically clever because then you go into remission and it's easy and feasible. And then you get a soft start with the family. Of course, we treat the ketoacidosis first according to protocols. But as soon as that has resolved, we go for normal glycemia. We involve both parents equally. If a child has only one parent, that parent will have to struggle very, very hard to achieve normal glycemia. If the child only has one parent, then you need to identify the network around the family. Establish early contact with the entire diabetes team, a nurse, a psychologist, a social worker, a dietitian, and a doctor. They need a lot of psychosocial support and practical management of new tasks and situations. It's actually a very a big psychological trauma for the parents to, to learn finger pricks or injections, and then you need to go very fast to the pump. You start the pump and CGM, CGM within one week if the child is younger than four years. If the child is a bit older, in between four and seven years, we start CGM within one week and pump within one month because then it's not so much in a hurry. And also remember that early means early childhood. It's the window of window opportunity if you want to ingrain good lifestyle habits to protect the heart and cardiovascular health of the child. And the parents define the child's world. So they are setting the food choices, eating habits, the routines regarding physical activity. So all lifestyle intervention has to be family-centered and not just approach the child. Insulin treatment in young children is very much about food and eating, what to eat and when to eat. The what to eat is quite well answered in the ISPAD guidelines. Uh, and you can find them there. It's basically based on healthy child eating. 
But what is important when you want to add insulin treatment with a pump or any other method is no grazing. You need to have a structured meal order. You can't success with insulin treatment if the child is eating continuously. Uh, there is a big value in family-centered meals and don't panic. If the child doesn't eat, you have to stick to normal infant, toddler and preschooler upbringing and don't get terrified by the risk of hypoglycemia. Going into bolus dosing, uh, I would strongly recommend to use the bolus calculator as a tool and the fine tuning of bolus dosing in these small children really makes uh, a bolus a pump useful for dosing the small doses. Aim at giving all bolus doses five to 20 minutes before the meal when using analogs as list for aspirate or fast aspirate. Always give a correction dose five to 20 minutes before the meal. If you are stuck in a tricky period, if you are in a context where you have to quickly learn your child to eat uh, strange food, give at least half or two thirds of the planned meal adjusted those five to 20 minutes before the meal and the rest as soon as possible, as soon as you see that the child eat. Uh, because if you give the bolus too late, you will get into a very tricky situation with first hyperglycemia and then hypoglycemia. And using a pump gives you a better option to give small bolus doses. We use a bit more aggressive, if I can say so, uh, bolus calculator setting in these children, approximately double the ones that we use in older children or adults. Uh, it's like 150 per, uh, for breakfast, 200 for the last evening meal and 250 for the other meals during the day. And then, of course, adjust the uh, settings according to the individual child and the individual life situation. The correction dose is as in older children and adults, 100 per total daily dose. And remember that I'm counting in millimole, so you have to refer this to uh, the other way of counting if you use milligram per deciliter, that's 1800. And aim for 6.0 millimole per liter or approximately 100 milligram per deciliter when calculating bolus doses. Because if you do not aim at the middle of the road, six is exactly in the middle of four to eight, then the risk of ending up in uh, either, either ditch or the side of the road is increasing. Basal settings. Basal dose is often not more than 30 to 45 percent of total daily dose in these young children. And have done a sketch to show, and if it's a small picture, I'll talk you through it. The need of basal dose is very low during the night between some pair of three and seven in the morning. It's due to physiology. And then the basal dose need increases slightly over the day. When the child has a nap after lunch, for instance, the basal need increases during those hours. And then in the evening, you have to be very, very well aware that there is a high need of a high basal dose in the evening, somewhere between eight and midnight. And then all of a sudden, somewhere between midnight and one o'clock, the need for basal dose is rapidly decreasing. Now I'm going to split up a bit and move into the infants. And first I want to point out, if you have a patient diagnosed before the age of six or nine, 12 months, you need to test for monogenic diabetes. What I think is very important in this age group is that they need breastfeeding in accordance with WHO recommendations, but not continuous feeding because it's very hard to insulin treat if a child is eating continuously. So you need a somehow structured schedule age dependent in this very young age group. You can carbohydrate count. Remember that human breast milk is a bit sweeter than cow milk. 
it's about seven gram per carbohydrate, seven gram carbohydrate per hundred gram. And of course, if you do weigh the eating, sometimes you will know how much the child eats and then you can follow it on the CGM. And for off-label use, you can, sit, can consider and discuss with a well-informed family if it might be an option to dilute insulin. There is further discussion on this in the ISPAD guidelines for treating of infants. Moving to the toddlers, uh, one of the problems we see with the toddlers is that we say that they have so tricky blood sugar, but I think it might be so that they are all walking into big shoes. We are trying to use pumps built for teenagers and adults in this small population. Uh, we always need to let the diabetes treatment follow the general development. The child doesn't understand diabetes or procedures. The child just has to trust the parents that they will help. And everyday life is a as a toddler includes a lot of frustrating moments when the adults tell you what you have to do and what you ha don't have to do. And some things are very uh, easy and some things are tricky as getting your hair combed or your shoes put on or a new needle for the insulin pump. A lot of the families stress is about food and eating. You need to deal with this in a culture sensible way and to involve the child in the, the local culture of eating. But you also need to bear in mind what's possible to do with insulin, a structured meal order. A good way for parents is to think out loud and this is what many parents all over the world do intuitively. They tell the child, now this is going to happen, we are going to do this, and this is good for this. And this is depending on the fact that the child has a good uh, receptive language, but not so many words of themselves. So they are evolving their thinking and understanding and making insulin treatment a normal part of their life. You have to remember that the children have a lot of infections every year. This is normal, but it affects the insulin needs. So you need to have a good understanding from the parents how to adjust the insulin treatment. And they, they need to have the courage to sometimes double or triple the insulin doses when the child has fever. And of course, follow this on the CGM. And, and add some finger pricks to be sure that the CGM is doing correct. And of course, you need to be aware of the risk of uh, misinterpreting the ketoacidosis as gastroenteritis. And please remember that the child can have gastroenteritis and ketoacidosis at the same time. The so measurement of ketones and understanding of physiology is a key feature when treating toddlers and all other children with diabetes. The toddler becomes a preschooler. The preschooler gets an increased verbal language. They get increased motor skill. They are exploring the world and they are very busy playing. And playing is very, very important. And you need to have an insulin treatment that, that doesn't interfere with playing all the time. So CGM, with automatic transfer of data to the parent's mobile phone might give some um, good fr freedom to the child. And it also gives the child a possibility to go and play with friends and stay with grandparents and the parents can support from a distance. You need to involve the child in the treatment. They are daily practicing everything they need to know, but expect no responsibility. This is a child who doesn't understand math, who doesn't who can't read, who doesn't understand time, they, but they are increasing the verbal skill and they can participate in understanding and thus accepting and integrating insulin treatment because they are going to live with this for the rest of their life. But as an aunt adult taking care of a, a preschooler, you need to know what can be negotiated and what cannot. We are on a flight toward pump treatment. 
and uh, uh, you can't negotiate what time the plane will leave. So where are we heading? Uh, yes, it was very important uh, this January when the Kids Up Consortium from Cambridge published the randomized trial of closed loop in very young children, making uh, it's obvious that hybrid closed loop is superior to sensor augmented pump therapy, even in preschoolers and toddlers. Uh, they have also shown that the young children have higher variability in insulin requirement. So this is the age group most in need of the hybrid closed loop because the insulin dose can be doubled from one day to another. And this also has to be uh, remembered when constructing algorithms suitable for this age group. The families show that this kind of treatment is perceived as very much easier to perform and improves quality of sleep for parents in young children with type 1 diabetes. Uh, there is very few systems available for this age group, but research is ongoing. And here is a very, very uh, important task for the pump companies to really publish uh, good results on this age group and also making adjustments in their current algorithms to suit this age group. Uh, and there I would like to thank you and really apologize for showing smaller slides than my intention. No ma'am, but your slides were very informative and we were able to visualize it. So moving further, thank you for your such a nice presentation. We had onboarded the flight and we had come to know about the infants, the toddlers and the preschool. With this, I would like to invite my mentor, my co-chair and the technology person of our country, Dr. Jyoti Dev sir, to further carry on the session and invite our next speaker, Dr. Pratik sir, to give his opinion and his talk on thank emergency you. situations. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Savarip. Uh, sorry for being very late uh, because of my uh, some family emergencies. So, so I look to Dr. Debashish. Dr. Pradeep has joined. Dr. Pradeep has joined. Okay. So how can I introduce Pradeep? Pradeep is uh, probably, <coughs> Pradeep Chaudhary is the most well-known speaker, orator, researcher, uh, working from outside India. So he's originally from India. And uh, last week at the ATTD, uh, uh, I could see him and he was lecturing in more than 15 to 20 forums. So he is the most sought after speaker in almost all these international forums. And uh, I would uh, like to uh, introduce him as the professor of diabetes for those of you uh, not that familiar with uh, this professor. Uh, he currently is working at the University of Leicester. Uh, he has clinical and research interest into the mechanisms and management of hyperglycemia and awareness and use of education technology. And he was so kind uh, to have the collaboration, official collaboration of uh, uh, Diabetes Technology Network UK uh, is collaborating with DTACOR. So that is an official collaboration. And Dr. Uh, Pratik is a very, very, very close friend of Dr. Benji Sabu. So with this introduction, uh, let me invite him. And he is going to speak on a very practically relevant topic, emergency care tips. Very, very important topic. Thank you very much. And over to Dr. Pradeep. Thanks, Jyoti, for that uh, lovely invitation. Always, uh, as you know, it's always uh, lovely to be back and speaking with our friends in India. Let me just make sure I share the right slides. Here we go. Yeah, is that right? Very okay. much. Yeah. Yeah. And I so, think it is, it is showing in uh, present view. Uh, uh, now it is fine. Now it is fine. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. So, always when I have two screens, it sometimes gets confusing. The computer randomly picks uh, which screen it's going to use. Um, yeah. So, thanks, Jyoti. And uh, it, it's fantastic for the DTN to collaborate with DTEC Org. And, you know, um, the Diabetes Technology Network, which we set up in the UK, has been really important in, in helping education of our colleagues, also education of people living with diabetes around the use of diabetes technology, but then also creating guidance, creating pathways, and, and lobbying government uh, and policy to help get access to technology as well. 
and hopefully DTEC Org can uh, we can collaborate, we can help DTEC Org to to do the same for my home country for for India as well. So uh, I was asked to speak on emergency care tips, uh, and I think this is getting increasingly important because the diabetes technology landscape is transforming the way we measure glucose, uh, whether that's connected glucose meters, whether that's uh, more uh, increasing access to continuous glucose monitoring, is changing the way we deliver insulin. Um, the ATTD that uh, Jyoti was saying we were at uh, last week, we, we saw you know, connected pens from all the major companies coming through. And, and these really help us understand what insulin the patient is taking, what they're on. But also if someone comes in in an emergency situation, it helps us see what doses they were on uh, and uh, what we need to give them. Insulin pumps and closed loops, of course, um, are getting increasingly prevalent. And, and although the percentage uh, of people using these systems is low in India, my understanding is if you look at the total numbers, there's probably more people on pumps in India than there are in, in many of the uh, smaller European countries. And finally, what the connected devices do, whether that's connected uh, blood glucose measurement systems or connected insulin delivery systems, is give us data. And when someone comes into hospital, um, who we don't recognize because they're not our patient. Knowing what their background control is, identifying that from the data can be very valuable in getting better glucose control during their hospital stay. Uh, and, you know, just a, a comment in the UK at the moment, 70% of people with type 1 diabetes are using flash glucose monitoring. About 10 to 15% people are using CGM, and maybe 20% are using pumps, with about 2%, 2 to 3% using closed loops. And those percentages are going to rise year on year. Uh, and that means that these people will have other medical conditions. People using diabetes technology will go in for an emergency uh, surgery, will have uh, pneumonia. In the last two years, they've had COVID. People go in for hip replacements, joint replacements, all those kind of elective surgery things, cardiovascular disease, and they will be using these uh, technologies. So as part of the DTN, we recognize that there was a need um, to create some guidance for people using different technologies and hospitalized patients. The first guidance we created about four years ago was this clinical guidance. Again, you could just Google DTN UK and you'll find these guidance. They're free for anyone to download. And the first one we created was what do you do if someone on a pump comes into hospital? How should that be managed in hospital? And if you think about it, the reasons for any person with diabetes to be admitted can be three major categories. They can either be admitted because of an acute diabetes emergency that could be a severe hypoglycemic event, or that could be a severe hyperglycemic event, ketoacidosis or hyperosmolar um, hyperglycemic sy uh, syndrome. They could be admitted because of an intercurrent illness anyone could have, um, or they could be going in for a planned procedure. And maybe the approach to what you do with technology is different depending on what they come in. So if I take the first one, which is the, you know, for severe hypofine people who come in, you treat the hyperglycemia, you want to be looking at the data and uh, maybe adjusting the therapy, linking in with whoever their uh, clinician is. For DKA, this is relatively common. And actually in our closed loop pilot, we even had uh, a number of people on close, going onto the closed loop coming in with DKA recently. And the most common cause of DKA is cannula failure caused by infrequent set changes. So we know that as soon as the, the cannula sets last for three days, certainly in a self-pay market like India, I'm sure people try to stretch out the cannulas for seven or eight days, as long as they can to reduce their costs. And every day past the third day that you keep the cannula in, your risk of ketoacidosis goes up. And that's why as uh, people running pump services, of course, we get very anxious when we see people not monitoring. And if you, and we, it's really important to tell people that if you're on a pump, and in particular, if you're using the set for longer than its recommended duration, then if you see a reading that's high, reading at 300, 400 milligram per deciliter, you've got to think about set failure because people, um, often people who come in with DK, they're saying, I gave the bolus to the pump. I kept giving insulin. My sugar was high. It didn't come down and I ended up in DK. Or a classic one is I've had a, a number of patients who late at night, their sugar has been high before bedtime. They've had a reading of 300, 350. They've done a bolus correction and they've gone to sleep or they've even changed their cannula and gone to sleep. And when they've changed their cannula, sometimes if that second cannula is kinked, they are thinking that things are okay. Sugar levels are high, and by morning, they're in DKA. So that's uh, something that's really important. So if someone comes in with DKA to hospital, standard advice is you've got to revert to insulin injections for the first 24 hours, treat the DKA, get rid of the ketones, have a look. Um, uh, and, you know, the patient should all be given an emergency supply of pen insulin to avoid the admission. But if they come in, then 
you, you need to keep the, treat the DK and then after day two, you can get them back onto the pop. An important thing that we were, uh, this is a pathway that we are just creating. So within the UK, we've got Diabetes Technology Network, but there's an overarching group called Joint British uh, Guidance, JBDS, Joint British Diabetes Societies. And they've created a lot of guidance on how to manage DK and how to manage um, different diabetes emergencies. Uh, and we're just in the process of writing some guidance for technology in hospital. Uh, and what we're realizing is that a lot of people using technology are going into hospital, being seen by emergency care physicians, seen by surgeons who don't know what the technology is. They think they know what it is. And that's led to a lot of mistakes and errors in hospital. So it's a simple guidance. If, if you see someone in hospital who's with a piece of machinery attached to their skin, does it monitor glucose? Does it deliver insulin? We've had quite a few people where the doctors thought this, uh, the, oh, this is the patch. It was the glucose measurement patch. And they've taken the, it was an omnipod and they've taken the pump off. Or the other way around, they've seen a patch that's a Libre. They think, oh, this is a pump. This person does not need to be given uh, any insulin because the pump is giving it. And the person has gone into DK. So, you know, does it monitor glucose check? If no, uh, if it doesn't monitor glucose, then it's going to deliver insulin. If it does, if it's a CGM, is it a real-time CGM or a flash monitor? Uh, and do you need to swipe it to get data? If it delivers insulin, um, you know, is there another device? Is that a closed loop system? Um, so understand what's going on. So if someone comes in using an insulin pump, it, what you do with them depends then on how ill the patient is. So if I take you down this pathway that we've created, you've got if the patient is well enough to manage the pump on their own, they can stay on their pump but keep an eye on things and review to all is appropriate. This might be sensible in the sort of scenarios when people have gone in for an uh, elective procedure or when they're, they're not that clinically ill, but they're having waiting for investigations to be done or, or whatever's that sort of admission. If they're not in DK and not in severe hyperglycemia, but they're unwell, not eating or drinking, or they're not feeling well enough to manage the pump themselves, then the best thing to do is switch over to an alternative uh, and in most hospitals in the UK, I'm sure in the same in India, um, you've just got variable rate insulin infusion, IV insulin or subcut in some places and refer to the inpatient diabetes team. If the patient is hypo, of course, um, treat the hyperglycemia and pause the pump. If you, if you know how to do that and that's uh, sensible, it's not essential, but temporarily for about an hour, pause it. And then you can, um, if the hyperglycemia persists despite two rounds of hypo treatment, take them off the pump and uh, go back to IV insulin, uh, IV dextrose, whatever you need to do to manage that. Again, if you've treated the hypo successfully, you can restart the pump and then connect with the patient to see what's going on. And then as I said before, if the patient is admitted with ketoacidosis, then you take the pump off, take the infusion site off, treat the DK using your local protocol, and then restart things once the patient is fit and uh, well to manage things. Um, now, a lot of patients with diabetes have elective procedures. And so if someone's on a pump for elective procedures, then if there's no, uh, if the minor procedure with less than two hours, then generally the patient can, if they make sure the glucose is in range before the procedure, and then just keep things, keep things going. If it's a major procedure with more than two hours duration, where they're likely to miss more than one meal, generally our advice is uh, take the pump off, use an IV insulin regime, and then once the patient is fit and well and comfortable to manage their own condition, you can then restart them back on pump in that scenario. And again, if they're hypo, treat using a hypo uh, standard protocol. You can leave the pump in place. And this is mainly for anesthetists, uh, a pathway that you can put in your OT, put in your theaters for anesthetists to follow if someone on a pump comes in to a hospital. Um, if the pump alarms during the procedure, don't, don't try to adjust it. Just keep a close eye on the blood glucose in the OT, and if the alarm is intrusive, then you can take the pump off and store it in a safe place. The other important area um, is, is uh, and certainly insulin pump therapy during uh, pregnancy is really valuable, really helps women get to those levels that help the baby, uh, you know, maintain gl glucose control during the pregnancy. And so we've got a pathway there again for women uh, using pump therapy admitted in labor or for emergency section. And so in that scenario, usually in the lead up, uh, so uh, about 70% of our type ones on, uh, who are pregnant will be on an insulin pump. They're, almost everyone's offered it. The people who don't use a pump, it's their particular choice not to use a pump. And what we do around about 
33, 34 weeks is make sure we bring the partner in and have a discussion about their labor planning, what they're going to do during the labor, during the delivery for the use of the pump. And as long as the, and because we know the patients go to the obstetric ward where the midwives may or may not be the, the obstetricians may or may not be comfortable or knowledgeable about insulin pumps, we get a feel for how well the partner is uh, happy to continue managing the pump during labor and delivery. And generally, we'll keep the patient on the pump. Uh, again, if the glucose is below four, we'll treat the hypo. If uh, we measure capillary glucose hourly, and during that last 24 hours, during that labor, we try to keep the glucose really tight. There are some suggestions that if you if the sugars are really high in that last 24 hours, there may be a higher risk of neonatal hypoglycemia. Uh, and that's why we, we tend to be quite aggressive with that in that period. Uh, and keep the patient on pump. If, however, the glucose goes high and you've corrected it a couple of times, you can see here, our protocol says recheck, do a correction to the pump, recheck an hour later. If it's still in control, that's okay. But if it's rising, you can give another correction bolus. But if you've got two corrections and the glucose isn't down, swap to IV because we don't want to leave the glucose high too long. And of course, when you change the rate of IV insulin infusion, the insulin, the insulin works straight away. But with subcut, there's always going to be a 30-minute delay. And that's why uh, it's going to take longer to correct the high glucose during labor than uh, than with I, with subcut than with IV. Some common myths that I've come across in our own hospital from uh, colleagues is um, I've I've had some I've had a patient undergo bariatric surgery who went into DKA because the anesthetist thought this patient's on a pump so they don't need to give IV insulin and by the end of the surgery the patient was in DKA. So a lot of uh, you know myths amongst our colleagues, medical colleagues, that pumps are inside the body, so they don't need um, to give IV insulin. No, of course, we know that they're on the skin. Pump does all the work. No, actually, usually it's the people use the insulin to do the work, and, and they take more boluses, take more injections, so they need to be aware of it. And the pumps are rare. No, but we have you know quite a lot of pumps, even a, in, in unless you've got 400 pumps. I was working in Kings, where we had 1,000. 50% of our type 1 population was using pumps there. Um, another important thing to remember about that we need to tell our patients for, but also inform our radiographers and radiology colleagues is diabetes tech and procedures. I've had at least in the last 10 years, 20 or 30 pumps fried by an MR scanner where they've gone in. The recommendation is that actually they shouldn't be used in a CT scanner either. And so for short procedures, you have to make sure that when someone's going in, particularly with the MRI scanner, when they have your questionnaire, do a body check, make sure the pump's in a safe place. But if, if someone's coming off the pump, they need to have an alternate way of insulin delivery um, during that period. Uh, oops. So just to go through the um, for surgery again, just to be a bit more uh, detailed about that. If, uh, for people with day case, uh, they can probably manage on the pump. Uh, you need to make sure if someone's going to an operation that they make sure that they put their cannula in a different place, and that might need make them they have to think three days in advance where they're going to site their site their pump. For cannulas and for CGM, the recommendation is if diathermy is being used during the operation, particularly bipolar diathermy, then don't use the, the pumps because of the, basically the risk of the elements heating up and frying the sensors. Um, I think a lot of our patients have kept their Libre or, or their CGM on during surgery without a problem, but, but the manufacturer's recommendation is, is that. And, um, here, so surgery requiring diathermy. And then post-procedure, if the patient's on pump therapy, again, make use it to do the correction bolus if the capillary glucose is over 10 or that's 180 milligram per deciliter. And if the sugar levels go up and are above 12, so above, yeah, that's uh, roughly 200 milligram per deciliter, then change to an intravenous insulin infusion uh, to bring the sugars down. Set might be not working. The patient might be um, you know, in physiological stress. And again, if the pump alarms, some recommendations, the anesthetists don't bother uh, just keep going as you're, as you're going. But if the alarm gets too insistent, just take the pump off and uh, keep it somewhere safe. These are expensive pieces of equipment and we have lost a lot of equipment here in the UK where it's all NHS reimbursed. It's fine, the government takes a hit. But if someone uh, in India loses a five lakh rupee pump, they, I'm sure they're going to be um, not happy. In fact, on that point, um, we actually ask all our patients to include the pump on their home insurance because if they're on holiday, if the pump gets lost or stolen, we've had a few people whose pumps have been stolen because someone thinks it's a page or a phone. Um, they can reclaim that cost on their on their um, home insurance. So that's uh, maybe in, in, in the self-pay market in India, that might be, a, again, a, a point to remember. Um, 
And if we're stopping the pump, again, uh, the patient might choose to stop the pump. But generally, if, if in, the, in the hospital setting, if you're stopping the pump, we would recommend take it off with the insertion with the cannula, the whole thing, because having a pump but having it suspended in the body, again, can create confusion um, amongst people uh, who are not used to dealing with pumps. Of course, when you've got patch pumps like the Omnipod or the Medrum, which are available in the UK, then they don't have the tubing. And again, we've got we've had scenarios of surgeons uh, or physicians from other places cutting the tubing, um, which again is not recommended. And then you've got to keep the pump in a in a safe place. Um, again, when you're putting a pump on, uh, be careful. Make sure you have that overlap between IV insulin and, and starting the pump of at least an hour after because <clears throat> the pump is delivering insulin subcut. It takes a while for it to to pick up. And again, make sure any patient going in for a procedure has a clear record of their settings because they may be lost if the pump battery is removed, if the pump is beeping and alarming, someone might take the battery out and lose that. So the pump has been uh, removed. Um, usually you should put a fixed prime to refill the dead space within the cannula, and then they can click in and restart. And again, generally, even if the glucose isn't high, I'd recommend a, a bolus correction or take a small bolus just to get some insulin in before the baser would take two or three hours to pick up. So, and when you're transferring from IV back to um, pump, make sure we use a new cannula and restart the pump after that fixed prime. Uh, and then again, when you just, if they've been on long acting insulin, if they've gone off the uh, pump therapy because they've, and they've taken a background insulin to J or Lantus for a while, then often if we're coming back onto pump, we'll use a, a temporary basal rate drop down to 70% for 24 hours, just to let that basal insulin wash out. So the COVID, during the COVID pandemic, there was a lot of increased use of CGM in hospitalized patients. Uh, but again, in the US, Dexcom wasn't allowed to be used, but a number of hospitals picked that up. It wasn't completely widespread, but Dexcom got special dispensation to be used um, in, for inpatient use. In the UK, I was chair of the Diabetes Technology Network. We, we got a donation of 10,000 Libre census to help with contactless glucose monitoring. Uh, as you all know, with COVID, there was a huge surge of hyperglycemia, people using dexamethasone. And there was a concern, you know, we're all fully kitted up with FP3 and gowns and things. And then to have to prick the finger, how do you get contactless if the patient, we put the sensor on, and then from outside the, you know, the patient, does, the doctor can doesn't have to deglove, patient doesn't have to deglove, and you can minimize contact with these COVID positive patients. And that was a pretty successful uh, story it also helped with support of patients coming out of hospital uh, where the insulin requirements were coming down. We, we started a lot of patients on insulin during COVID um, that came off between two to four weeks after. And those sensors really helped for that. Um, and actually, the, the sensors have been safe and effective in most ward situations. I think we've got a lot of concerns and our internal guidance has been, and there's no national guidance on this, our internal guidance has been to do at least two finger prick readings during the day on any person where you've got Libre. And, uh, and that helps you understand whether the Libre is reading accurately or not, the CGM is reading accurately or not. Certainly in those with, with uh, sepsis, with low blood pressure, people on ITU, uh, there's often a greater gap between what the sensor is saying and what the real glucose is. Um, luck, and actually what happens if the sensor is under reading, that's in a sense you're on the safer side because you're gonna give less insulin, but sometimes that difference can be quite high. I think there's got quite a lot of data now on the accuracy of CGM in renal patients and people undergoing minor procedures. And in fact, if, you know, and I think a lot of the data early on was through sensors that were having an MAID above 10%. But if you look at where the market is now with Libre2, uh, G6, um, and the latest sensors, most of them have a MAD less than 10, and they're relatively accurate during surgery. I just listed the MADs there. And of course, these sensors are now accurate enough that you can use them to drive closed loop therapy in non-critical care. And that to me is the biggest uh, 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 thing saying that we, we're, we're happy to guide therapy using these sensors in hospital uh, for people who are not unwell. So I guess, and I just uh, coming up with this, and this is a, you can see it's still a draft guidance. We're still trying to ratify it, but we're still trying to see for a variable rate insulin infusion normally, depending on the glucose, we'll have a standard rate of insulin. If it's below four, we'll stop. If it's between four and eight, so that's between 80 and 160. Uh, 150, we might have one unit per hour if it, and increase the rate of insulin as the glucose levels rise. But actually, you can use the arrows and adjust the rate of insulin depending on whether the glucose is rising or falling. And that might 
reduce the risk of hyperglycemia. So we're just piloting the use of this sort of uh, modulated variable rate insulin infusion using fl- CGM in hospitals at the moment. And I've got a, a project running in Groningen uh, with a, a, a young uh, colleague called Peter van Dijk. Uh, and we hope to show those data soon. Um, I'm going to skip over this. And finally, we just created this um, uh, flyer for the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. And this happened after uh, a patient had his Omnipod taken off because the patient thought it was a, a glucose sensor and the patient went into DK. And so we've just created this uh, flyer that's been circulated amongst all the emergency medicine uh, colleagues just to make them aware that they're seeing more and more people with technology in hospital. So yeah, so in summary, I think as we have more widespread use of diabetes technology, we, we will need to speak to our colleagues outside the diabetes world and make them aware of this technology and how to use it uh, and how they can use these technologies to help glucose control in hospital um, and hopefully reduce hospital stay for our patients. Thank you. Very well done, Dr. Pratik Chaudhary. And you spoke about certain areas we are usually scared to speak about, especially about our colleagues. So we'll have further discussion <laughs> at the end of the lecture. Uh, so Dr. Thomas Dane is here. Welcome, Dr. Thomas Dane, our good friend. Uh, I don't oh, think morning. that Dr. Thomas requires any introduction. The past president of his pad, and uh, he is uh, into multiple multi center clinical trials related to insulin pumps and automated delivery systems. And he is also the former research fellow at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center uh, at Boston. And he is a recipient of Lifetime Achievement Award of the International Diabetes Federation. And he is going to touch upon a very, very relevant topic. And that is on the use of hybrid closed loop system in children. Over to our dear friend, Dr. Thomas Danny. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, it's early Sunday morning here, so I have to speak a little bit, not to wake up everyone in the house. Uh, and uh, I really look forward uh, to this talk. And now let me see if I can start it. Okay. There you go. Perfect. There it is. Just a little moment. There we go. Yeah, now it is fine. Very good. Okay, so uh, this is now the the school on hybrid closed loop in uh, in uh, children, and uh, I will first uh, start with a study we just recently uh, published on young, very young children below age six, and uh, those children. Uh, between 6 and 12 and uh, or 14 and you will see that actually it works very very well also in this age group um, my it always takes a couple of seconds for my uh, computer to move it's a little bit frozen but um, and then we will uh, move on and uh, discuss some very practical issues how uh, what the big differences are the learnings are uh, how to use a uh, hybrid closed loop in the children. So hopefully we'll start moving. Still frozen. Ah, there we are. Okay, so what I want to show you here is the smart home trial. And what we did, uh, we compared the hybrid closed loop with the predictive low glucose uh, system, which only stops the insulin when the glucose is too low. We did this in two groups, uh, 18 children aged uh, 2 to 6 and uh, 20 children aged 7 to 14. Uh, the average age were obviously different. It was uh, 5.4 years in the younger group and 11.6 in the older group. Uh, please note that already at the onset, the glycemic control was pretty good uh, on average in those uh, below six years. It was uh, the A1C was seven, so nearly reaching the ISPAT target for A1C and 7.7 in the older group. And uh, so we first randomized them from just sensor augmented pump without any uh, intervention in terms of automated insulin delivery. Uh, for eight weeks, and then we uh, crossed over, and the primary endpoint was uh, time in range. 
And here you see the outcomes uh, with uh, just the predicted low glucose suspend. Yes, you were able to reduce the hypoglycemia as you would expect slightly. It was already uh, close to the goal of having less than 4% hypoglycemia in both groups was a little bit above four, and then it was uh, close to 4%. And uh, uh, so the uh, predictive low glucose suspend was able to reach the uh, a little bit higher uh, time and range, but the big jump really came with a hybrid closed loop where you're not only uh, suspending the insulin in case of low glucose, but also giving additional insulin when you are um, uh, when you are high. And you see that this uh, that both groups uh, were had a had a big uh, increase. What were the learnings here? Well, the learnings were that the improvement is immediate. So once you are starting somebody on a hybrid closed loop, you can see that this improvement in time and range is happening immediately. And the second learning is that once you are um, taking him off hybrid closed loop and switching back to uh, just predictive low glucose uh, management, uh, this effect is gone again. So in order to really reap the benefits of a hybrid closed loop in children, you have to wear it consist uh, consistently. The good news is when you are wearing it, these uh, benefits remain, they are sustained. So as long as you are in the hybrid closed loop mode, you will have this improvement of glycemic control. Now, if we look at the achievement of uh, the treatment goals in the different age groups, you can see that already on the onset, the preschoolers were very high in uh, treatment achievement, but they were then well above 80% with all time and range goals. So in terms of the glucose management indicator, in terms of time and range uh, being more than 70%, time and range below, uh, below range uh, less than 4%, so um, same goes uh, for the school children, but I think uh, that you know 88% um, target achievement in children below age six. If you would have told me that five years ago, I would have called you crazy this, uh, that this is impossible because small children have a very high uh, um, variability in insulin need, a very uh, high glycemic variability. And it's very difficult to treat very small children. And it's amazing that they, they came close to 90% uh, target achievement uh, in this age group. So uh, here's an example, uh, what really is done. It's not about more insulin or less insulin whatsoever. You see that the basal dose in the uh, hybrid closed loop mode, which is the light blue uh, curve, compared to the uh, sensor augmented uh, pump, which is the uh, orange uh, curve, you see the amount of insulin is, is very, very similar. It's uh, 16 units uh, per day uh, with the hybrid closed loop, it's 15 units per day uh, with the sensor augment pumps. And the bolus dose were absolutely identical, 11 units in both uh, time periods. But nevertheless, uh, this uh, two and a half year old had a 26% higher time and range from 45% to 71%. And if we look at the average glucose, uh, it was 195 uh, with a sensor augment pump and 147 uh, with a hybrid closed loop. So, the, so this really shows it's about the distribution of insulin. It's not about the amount of insulin, which is different in those groups. I will move now on to very practical issues because we have a pump school here. And, and so really to give you some pointers, what do we have to look for if we're starting hybrid closed loop? What independent from the type uh, uh, of uh, hybrid closed loop because there are several uh, possibilities now. The most uh, uh, used ones are the uh, tandem controlled IQ and the uh, Medtronic 780 uh, or, or 670 hybrid closed loop uh, systems. And um, so first of all, we have to understand that it doesn't make sense anymore to talk about basal insulin and bolus insulin. Um, it's better to really talk about what is user initiated. So what does the patient actually do what, uh, when he uh, enters carbs and is, is initiating an, 
uh, bolus or where is the correction bolus uh, happening, which is uh, modulated automatically uh, by the pump. And it's very difficult to really say, so, so where does bolus start if the pump is giving it uh, uh, and where does uh, where it's just a change in the basal rate. So it's, it's kind of a change of the mindset that is important here. Now, uh, we recommend that the people should use the AID system uh, the way that uh, it is supposed to be. So um, in the early days, people, when they wanted to have more insulin because they felt their pump didn't give them enough, they entered fake uh, carbohydrates in order to um, get more insulin. Uh, this is not uh, very smart because kind of it, it, it cheats the algorithm. And uh, so we are not uh, really recommending that. Um, if we look at what is really one of the, the key learnings, how to, to improve the glucose control is that we have to really, in, in most of these systems, we have to have a very good focus on the insulin to carb ratio. Uh, very often we need a more quote unquote, aggressive insulin to carb ratio. So uh, very often uh, we need more insulin uh, for uh, the uh, carb account, which uh, of course uh, means that we have a, uh, um, uh, a lower uh, ICR uh, compared to the open load settings. Uh, here you can uh, see that hyper and hypoglycemia still happens uh, in hybrid closed loop. Uh, and uh, so if we see that, that, uh, that things are not going very well, we, we really have to look in the lower panel. You can see the insulin that is given. So uh, the, uh, the, the little lines are, are the boluses. And uh, uh, so you, you see how the basal rate is, is uh, adjusted uh, there as, as well. Um, so first thing is check the insulin carb ratio. Second thing, uh, see whether the patient is uh, doing an appropriate bolus timing. I'll speak to that in a second. And uh, also um, try to figure out how is the patient doing the carb counting? Is he, is he doing that well? What is the meal composition? Sometimes you can adjust the meal composition and give some pointers there as well. Now, um, it's, it's very important uh, to give the bolus still in advance of the meal because we uh, need to understand that if the glucose is rising, um, obviously, this uh, uh, automated insulin delivery will deliver more insulin. And this is quite different uh, from uh, the, the previous where, where basically the basal insulin was pre-programmed and, and didn't change. So if a bolus is missed or delayed, uh, one has to appreciate that a part of the correction is already given. And so there is the inherent risk of hypoglycemia if you uh, delay your mealtime bolus. So uh, here you can, uh, for example, uh, see an example where uh, th there is a, a rise because uh, this patient did not give uh, a mealtime bolus, which would be the light blue uh, um, uh, sign here. And you see that uh, the light blue with a, with a, with a black uh, line uh, is actually the automated uh, correction bolus. So uh, the pump has already given a, a, a correction bolus and at the same time has, has risen considerably uh, the basal insulin delivered a higher uh, basal rate. So when he then delivered his postprandial bolus, uh, there was a low glucose uh, thereafter at uh, eight o'clock. Here's another example, this time not with a control IQ, but with uh, the um, uh, Medtronic pump. Again, here is uh, 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 somebody gave the mealtime bolus, but the mealtime bolus was not suffi sufficient. So this is why the glucose was rising. Uh, then his next meal, as you can see, there is no bolus uh, uh, given. Um, and he then decided, or she decided to give uh, another bolus uh, postprandially but didn't uh, uh, appreciate that already the base rate was highly increased, as you can see with, with, with those, uh, the, the pink shaded area, uh, which is the basal insulin. And uh, so uh, there was uh, hypoglycemia, although the moment that the patient was uh, delivering the bolus, the pump completely stopped the basal rate. But of course, you cannot pull out the insulin out of the system once more. Uh, uh, and so he, uh, he or she uh, was, 
experiencing hypoglycemia. So if the mealtime bolus uh, is given, always give it preprandially. If you, for some reason, miss the bolus, reduce it at least by half uh, um, of, of what you would have given uh, for the amount of carbohydrates in order to account for this correction bolus. Very important. Exercise management. Exercise management is also very important. The, the basic idea here is that uh, while starting exercise, you want to have at as little insulin uh, in the system as possible. So the current practice uh, of eating before uh, an exercise to avoid hypoglycemia is no longer very smart. It is better if you have a prolonged exercise to take in small amounts of carbohydrates during the, the, the exercise, because uh, if you would eat before the meal, Obviously, you would have more uh, before the before the exercise. You would have more insulin in the system, and uh, you uh, always need to, uh, or you can use the exercise uh, mode in some pumps, like here in the uh, control IQ system. As you can see with the yellow bar, the yellow bar indicates that for this time you have a, a higher target range, making it less likely for you to have hypoglycemia uh, during the exercise. Interestingly. This might be less relevant for uh, India, uh, alcohol, where the liver is busy with the alcohol. Another situation where very often uh, hypoglycemia is um, uh, happening. And you can use the, the exercise models here as well, because it gives you a higher target for a time after alcohol consumption. So... Um, to, to sum up uh, the, the issue with the exercise, um, don't eat uh, immediately before uh, the exercise and uh, uh, understand that carbohydrate feeding uh, might be helpful if you have a prolonged day. Exercise. These um, recommendations hopefully will be published very, very soon uh, from this uh, ATPD consensus, uh, and uh, then you will be able to uh, look them up. Um, here, uh, if you um, uh, have to check, of course, the settings all the time. So here is a, a patient who had hyperglycemia and didn't really understand what was happening. Well, he forgot to turn off his uh, exercise motor. So he was, uh, we, we had a video consultation, realized that there was an ongoing yellow bar and he, he forgot to turn it off. And so he had a higher target range all the time, which then led to higher glucose levels. So always check the settings together with your patient. Uh, another big issue is hypoglycemia, and many people overtreat hypoglycemia, and this is, of course, particularly difficult if the insulin is turned off. So this, uh, the hybrid closed loop is uh, a low glucose suspend system, so if, if the glucose is already low, the insulin is likely to be suspended. So one should treat the uh, hypoglycemia only with 5 to 10 grams of carbohydrate. Uh, except uh, maybe for, for hypoglycemia doing exercise. Um, another issue is uh, the, when ketones occur and it could be a fusion set failure or whatever is there, I think it's safe to say it might always be the best advice uh, for such a, a situation to give the correction uh, using an insulin pen or syringe because you never know whether it's a, uh, what is going on, whether it's an infusion set failure. Um, and you you might uh, switch to an open loop modus uh, bef uh, before this uh, thing is, is getting out of hand because you don't know exactly what is going on. Um, the same holds true for sick days, particularly if somebody uh, is uh, starting to vomit. Um, Dr. Pradik already has discussed at great length uh, um, the treatment in the hospital. Um, again, this, the pump can be used during uh, small procedures. You can continue uh, using the hybrid closed loop here, um, maybe in order to uh, reduce the risk of uh, hypoglycemia. Again, use a temporary glucose target or, for example, the sports mode uh, to, uh, to protect for of hypoglycemia. Um, the recommendations regarding insulin is to use rapid acting insulins. Uh, I think we're still uh, looking for the ideal pump insulin. Uh, you can, of course, also use ultra rapid analogs when it's improved for the system. And uh, as of now, uh, there, there's, there's limited approval. 
Um, so uh, I think it's important also to say that for all children who are on hybrid closed loops, you need to have a, a plan for injection therapy because it, it's, a, it's a technical device. The insulin pump can always fail or break or be stolen because somebody thinks it's a cell phone. You know all that. So, so don't forget to, uh, to give your patient also um, an insulin regimen plan. Uh, the uh, last uh, issue here is uh, the, the idea of alarm fatigue. Uh, so uh, make sure that whenever uh, a patient uh, is um, uh, occurring uh, many alarms, uh, try to uh, be very um, careful with the alarms and only those, those alarms that are really necessary for safety that the patient is not having too many alarms. Um, we don't have separate treatment goals uh, for AID, as I have shown in the beginning, it is quite amazing uh, how much um, uh, time and target uh, patients are able to reach uh, with this uh, technology. Um, but currently, we don't have separate uh, goals for the patients. And my final uh, advice here is, uh, whenever you do a consultation with the patient uh, on hybrid closed loop, or maybe even every type, uh, type of insulin therapy, Always try to find a daily profile that you can show some appreciation uh, uh, how the child, adolescent, and family is doing and ex express how, how, how great it, it is, what the effort is. And as you can see here, very often there are really great days, not always 90% in target, uh, but often much better than they had before. So with this, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if there is time for questions, I'm, of course, happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas Dane. It was, a <laughs> it was a great learning experience. So we are all actually learning from our own errors over the last more than 20, 30 years. Manoj, welcome. Uh, so we will have a, uh, Dr. Saurabh, yes, shall sir. we have a five minutes discussion? Because uh, yes, sir. orations we are going on in the other hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we can yeah. have a five minutes discussion, basically. Basically, I have one or two questions to all, all our eminent speakers. So the, my first question will be with uh, to Dr. Thomas Dane, sir. Sir, what do you think as the technology in diabetes and insulin management is day by day, by day increasing? So do you think that in near to coming futures, we'll be having all artificial intelligence over, over the internet or facility readily available directly to our friends who are, who are having type 1 or type 2 diabetes? Or will it still it be that all the physicians and the doctors will be playing the only major role? So this is a very good question and, and very difficult to predict. Um, number one, I don't think that every patient will want to uh, have a closed loop. Um, many, particularly the very experienced patients, uh, um, feel the loss of control is, is very bothersome for, for them. They, they want to remain in control and they will prove to you that the closed loop is not as good as it should be. Um, another group of patients uh, tell you they, they, they want to be naked. You know, they don't want to have a, a big pump sticking on their body. And uh, so they, they will not uh, have such a system. Um, whether the start can be entirely uh, virtually, I don't really know. I think uh, personally, there is it's very important to have a person-to-person -person contact. Uh, there is a lot of trust needed uh, using a hybrid closed loop trust between the treatment team and the patient. And I don't think that you know I, I would be able to treat uh, the patient in India and and he would trust me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir, for such a nice and a wise answer. And we all we all got the point which you wanted to tell. Doctor Manoj, Manoj. Yeah. So two quick questions uh, to Pratik and then to Doctor Dan. Thank you both for the enlightenment. Pratik, uh, you you're aware about the hospital grade sensors that Abbott has in China? Um, no, these are the ones which are actually approved for in hospital use. I don't know why only in China and not rest of the world. Of course, during COVID, we got emergency approval for others but but some thoughts on that and then a question to dr dan uh, okay I'll, I'll wait for pratik's answer and then wait for jyoti to allow me i must admit i mean we've uh, for non critically ill patients i think now i mean there's so many papers that have shown that even the you know closed loops driven by standard dexcom or abbott sensors are safe and uh, and better than open loop in in hospital care and i think there's not so much of an issue with using those 
I must admit, as you say, I've heard about these uh, special hospital sensors and I've seen some IV sensors as well. So I don't know about the sensor you're talking about, but I know uh, we've been shown some intravenous sensors. And uh, I mean, these, you've got to say the complexity have... versus the, the accuracy and, and the cost and, you know, those things all come into play, don't they, when, you, when you're looking at how you manage things. So like Abbott has the Freestyle Libre and then it has the Libre Pro. Only for yeah. China, they have the Libre H, which is the hospital approved sensor. So I just said, I, I don't know why only there and not yet in other parts of the world. Yeah, I, I've not heard about it. We've used the Libre in, in, in hospitals safely. The H, I've not been aware of. My apologies. Okay. And, and, and to Dr. Dan, you know, uh, Thomas, about the hybrid closed loop system. So a couple of patients that we've initiated here, here on, um, there is the fear, as you said, of, of letting it go all automatic. It's, it's similar to us getting uh, a Mercedes Benz with the automated parking. And trust me, at least in India, and for us to park in our parking space, I can never trust or let my hands off, you know, with the fear that it's going to bang somewhere. So how do you, how do you really convince the patients to let go and, and have faith that this will be fine? Um, well, it's an anxiety issue, and, and we all have our own anxieties. And uh, I guess the only thing that cures anxiety is experience. So um, what, I, what we are doing is we are, in such a case, um, putting the, uh, the, the children in an in-hospital setting and uh, uh, kind of uh, tell both the parents and the children, we are there so that nothing can happen. And once they realize that even during vigorous exercise, they're not having a severe hypoglycemia and actually uh, with whatever glucose they go into the night, they come out with a great glucose in the morning uh, without the mother doing something at night and adjusting something. Um, slowly, sometimes they 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 are able to give uh, uh, way to the pump. But uh, I also have patients who simply fail; they cannot do it. They 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 turn it off and they say uh, it's giving me too much insulin. The system is killing me, and then there's not much you can do. A quick question to Dr. Thomas Dane. Uh, of course, we are also having FIASP in India, the faster acting insulin as part, and it has got a different uh, PKPD property when it is used to subcutaneously in the insulin pump. So on a, a personal experience, uh, using these two insulins, PS versus the other conventional rapid acting insulins, which one will you prefer? Because I know there are certain limitations and uh, some challenges involved in using the uh, very rapid acting, ultra rapid acting insulin. And if in case we are going to use it, uh, in brief, what are the modifications to be carried out in the insulin pump? Yeah, I, another very good question. Uh, I think the studies so far have been rather disappointing that uh, not much improvement in time and range was uh, done with the ultra rapid insulins. The question is, of course, whether the algorithm needs to be tweaked to make more use of this, or maybe uh, the insulins are still not fast enough and not quick enough so that it's not the, the ideal insulin yet. Um, we always in our hospital use uh, only the approved insulins. And so for most of the commercial pumps, uh, uh, only the rapid acting insulins are approved so far, but this might change in the, in the, in the near future. Uh, so I mean, we've, used is... we've used FIAS in quite a lot of our six. Uh, close oh, you're using FIAS? Pradeep, you are using yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And Lumjev actually. So we've, had, we've seen a lot of, uh, certainly our DIY users have found a 5 or 7% increase in time. range. they're cracking 90% with their DIY because the people who are in mid-80s with Lumjev have been able to not bolus on DIY closely and get above 90%. Uh, we've got a big community near where we are uh, who are pushing that. And so I think I've been far more proactive and I think slightly but less. But they, they actually yeah. have tweaked the algorithm, right? They're, they're not using the same algorithm. So that, that of course, makes a difference. Oh, that's the reason. Okay. But I think a lot of our patients who actually shifted when FIASP was made available here went back to ASPART because they didn't find the results. You think it's more of a cultural thing or food related? Do you feel that difference? Uh, we, we had very similar things when FIAS came out and the first lot I moved across, they came back um, very early on. But um, recently, I've, we've moved a lot of our patients onto FIASP, actually, uh, a lot of our home patients. And and they seem to be sitting on. I think there's not a huge amount of difference. The, the disappointing thing, I think that's what Thomas was saying, is that we've not seen, oh, suddenly with FIAS, an increase in time and range or a sudden drop in 
uh, in hypoglycemia, it's a very subtle difference, but um, maybe we'll need a few more numbers to, to work that out. It's not a big Actually, difference. Actually, in injection really. therapy, I have the feeling the, the difference is, is much larger. So we use it uh, more or less exclusively in injection therapy. Uh, Dr. Devashish, uh, you remember long ago, almost 15 years ago, we were using only insulin pumps and that, those times CDM was not popular. And uh, currently in India, we do have standalone insulin pumps without a CGM, like uh, 7 and 5, 7 to 2. So there are many patients using insulin pumps without a CGM and only with SMB. So do you think that there is a role of standalone insulin pumps without a CGM with the current data available? Uh, there is like uh, you you might have like uh, there are different recommendations uh, from AD and ACE for using insulin only pumps but practically in a, in a, in a real life world scenario if, if you have a patient who is very disciplined they're doing SMBG more than six times a day and and, and very proactive and and still having a good time and uh, having a still good a1c and not much of hypoglycemia still in those patients we can continue uh, insulin simple insulin pumps and if the cost is not a, a, a if cost is the issue there then maybe simple insulin pumps will do it and may, maybe more likely uh, in india you know dr jyoti dev 60 percent of patients are type 2 patients and and in, in some of these patients who cannot afford CGM because at the end of the day it's all pay out of the pocket. And if you add CGM, it'll add fifteen thousand rupees per month just for the CGM in India. So so such patients, I think if they are motivated and, and doing good SMBG, I think insulin pump only will be suffice enough. Excellent, excellent. Do you uh, do you agree, Dr. Pradeep, to use an insulin pump without a CGM in type two fine in, in type one diabetes? Do you agree? And either way, so if with cost is the issue, the data says that CGM is probably more beneficial than pump therapy. If you ever choose for technology monotherapy, you have to choose one technology. CGM, I think, has shown better results than pump alone. But for the last 30 years, we've used pump with SMBG with good results also. So there's no reason why suddenly all that data, all that experience is lost. I mean, Thomas, for 20, 30 years, we've been using pump with SMBG. And, and so I think CGM with MDI, is probably better than pump with SMBG, but it depends on where the problem is. Is the problem with delivery or with measurement? Right. If the person is measuring eight times a day, then the pump is going to give you value. If the person isn't measuring, that's when the CGM gives you value. And so you choose the right ther the right monotherapy for the right person. Then if you can pay, you then add the second one in. Right. So before we stop, let us have a take home message, and this should be based on the subject that you have spoken and especially on the usually committed errors. Uh, very briefly, take home messages. We will start from the basis. Uh, I think uh, now we have so many options. As I said, pump only, pump with CGM, pump with CGM with LGS, then you have automated delivery systems. I think uh, as a physician, we should discuss with the patient, caregivers, families, look into all the issues, clinical, personal, cost, uh, hypoglycemia issues and then take a combined call together with the family that which one will best suit them which will motivate them to continue and get good results rather than telling them you just go to aid or something on that excellent over to dr pradeep um, i think we've got to be a bit more brave and a bit more confident about using tech in hospitals but also we need to raise awareness of diabetes technology uh, in our non-specialist colleagues Right, right. Dr. Thomas? Well, uh, I think really the automated insulin delivery is a game changer, uh, making us achieve targets we have never thought we would uh, before. And so in order uh, to reap those benefits, uh, don't invest a lot of time uh, to get uh, expensive insulins and try to make uh, technology cheaper and available to your patients. Excellent. We are all using automated insulin delivery systems in India as well. At the 780G, I fully agree it is a game changer and most of our patients are having a EAR of more than 85 to 95 percentage. So thank you. Thank you very much, Metronic, for bringing this to India. So this has been a very, very important and entertaining session. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pradeep, Dr. Basis, and Thomas Dane, especially for being live in this session. So thank you so much from you. the tech. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.